turn with me in the Word of God to Isaiah chapter 7, verses 10 through 17. Isaiah chapter 7, verses 10 through 17. Give attention to the reading of God's holy, inspired, and infallible word. Again, the Lord spoke to Ahaz. Ask a sign of the Lord your God. Let it be deep as Sheol or high as heaven. But Ahaz says, I will not ask, and I will not put the Lord to the test. And he said, Hear then, O house of David. Is it too little for you to weary men that you weary my God also? Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel. He shall eat curds and honey when he knows how to refuse evil and choose the good. For before the boy knows how to refuse the evil and choose the good, the land whose two kings you dread will be deserted. The Lord will bring upon you and upon your people and upon your father's house such days as have not come since the day that Ephraim departed from Judah, the king of Assyria. So ends the reading of God's holy, inspired, and infallible word. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Let us pray. Lord God, Heavenly Father, we ask that you now would uh, aid us in understanding your word. Uh, Lord, we pray that you would uh, uh, that, that you would be with me in, in presenting your word, and giving me a clear recall and, and a clarity in truth, and give us all attentive ears, eyes, hearts, uh, to what you have to say to us in your word. We pray this in Christ's holy name. Amen. You may be seated. Last week, we were at the very beginning, or almost the very beginning of Scripture at Genesis chapter 3. And uh, we said that we were looking at the beginning of the scarlet thread of Scripture. We even got to look somewhat at the Emmanuel theme that God with us. God was with them in the garden. God was with them uh, in the prophecy, in the promise of the seed of Adam and Eve. And now we're, we're fast forwarding in history uh, to the kingdom period. And to the book of Isaiah. Some have called Isaiah the fifth gospel because it contains so much good news and so much about Christ. There's prophecy after prophecy after prophecy, and we're just going to look at two over the next couple weeks. And this one, of course, being one of the most familiar, at least the one verse about the baby to come that would be called Emmanuel. But I want to set the stage because I think there's a lot of other things that are going on here. Um, so the context is very important. At the beginning of this chapter, we see what's going on in the southern kingdom of Judah. Whereas in the kingdom of Syria, not Assyria, uh, there's, there are two different places in scriptures. Uh, Syria would be the area of modern day Syria and Jordan whereas us, Syria, would be further to the east. We see in, in Isaiah chapter 7, verse 1, it says, Rezin, the king of Syria, and Pekah, the son of Remaliah, the king of Israel, came down to Jerusalem to wage war against, but could not yet mount an attack against it. So Judah is under attack by their former countryman, Remaliah, the king of Israel, we are in the days of the divided kingdom of Israel to the north and Judah to the south, whereas under David they were one kingdom. And King Ahaz is trying to figure out what to do. Now Isaiah gives him some prophetic words in verses uh, 3 through 9, but then a second set of those prophetic words pick up in verse 10, and that's what we're going to be looking at. This morning, under the heading of 
a sign refused, a sign given, and a sign fulfilled. So again, at verse 10, again, the Lord spoke to Ahaz, ask a sign of the Lord your God. Let it be as deep as Sheol or as high as heaven. Ahaz is offered a very high honor. Many people have wanted signs from God or even asked for signs from God. Here, God is offering to Ahaz the opportunity to receive a sign. God is essentially saying, I'll, I'll move heaven and earth to give you whatever sign it is you need to see. A sign that was a chance for Ahaz uh, to show his trust and commitment in the Lord, and a sign for the Lord to show Ahaz that he could trust him to protect his people of Judah from Syria and from Israel. What a privilege! What an opportunity to be able to receive a sign from God. What a wasted opportunity. Ahaz refuses. Refuses the sign. He says, I will not ask. I will not put the Lord to the test. That sounds kind of noble the way he put it, isn't it? I, I'm not going to put the Lord to the test. But it's kind of foolish. If, if God offers to give you a sign, wants you to have that sign, and you refuse the sign, that's not wisdom. That's not noble. That's foolish. That is foolish. God wants you to have a sign, and he wants you to have it for some particular reason. Not only is it foolishness, it's arrogance. Especially since God initiated the sign. God was the one who promised it. It would be one thing for Ahaz to brazenly ask God for a sign. It's another thing entirely for, for God to offer him a sign. A sign so that Ahaz could have full confidence in God. And Ahaz says, I, I don't want to put the Lord to the test. But if we really look at this, it may be Ahaz who is the one who put, or who is being put to the test. And he fails. One commentator says, but to refuse a pro-offered sign is proof that one does not want to believe. Pious though his words sound, Ahaz, by using them, demonstrated himself to be willfully a willfully unbelieving man. And since he would not believe, he could not continue. So Ahaz refuses this sign. But God is not done. God, in fact, is going to offer a sign. But not before he chastises Ahaz in verse 13. He said, Hear then, O house of David, is it too little for you to weary men that you weary my God also? Something we should have caught in what was said. He doesn't say, Here, O Ahaz, or here, O king. He says, Here then, O house of David. Why is, why is God through Isaiah say that? I think it's because Isaiah's refusal to get this sign is going to have a profound impact 
on the whole house of David going forward. Why is the house of David important? Well, it's the lineage of the king, right? The king that God promised to have a king on the throne forever. Ultimately, we know that the ultimate fulfillment of that promise will be Jesus Christ himself, the Messiah. And he is messing with the lineage of the Messiah. He is messing with the seed of the throne of David. As much as a, a human being can do so. And he's wearying God by this. I have a feeling that this is not the first time that Ahaz has failed to trust God. That, that God was offering this to him to, as a final test before he sold him way out of town. While well, Ahaz refuses a sign, the Lord himself still gives a sign. And it's that sign that we are familiar with from this passage. Now therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Whereas before, the sign, if Ahaz had received the sign... It would have been out of divine pleasure. But now God is going to give this sign as a sign of divine displeasure. But what is unique about this, what's interesting about this, is that while it is a sign of displeasure to Judah, to King Ahab, this same sign ends up being a sign of divine pleasure for us. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. Now some try to do funny things with this verse, especially with the word virgin. I say virgin can mean a young, unmarried woman. That's how the word could be translated, and it would be correct to do so. But I think to do so is to miss a, a common sense kind of understanding of that. It would be the assumption that a young, unmarried woman would be a virgin. That's a would have been a very reasonable assumption in those days. Maybe not so much today, but certainly in those days. Now it's possible that there might have been some sort of double fulfillment intended. There may have been a child born in or around the, the time of Isaiah from a young woman uh, that was sort of an immediate fulfillment as a sign to Ahaz. It's possible. But we know that this is truly fulfilled with us, truly fulfilled in God with us, Jesus Christ, our Lord. That's the real fulfillment of this. Of course, at this point, there's no mention of any divine intervention or divine fatherhood of the child. Just simply that a virgin would give birth and bring forth a son. Now, again, that does give us a little bit of a hint. If we are, in fact, talking about a virgin giving birth to a child, be it a son or a daughter, that would require a miracle. We also have a hint in the name of this child. Emmanuel, God with us. This child would be called God with us. Which is a little bit of a hint about the parentage of this child. Who is this child's father? 
There's a little bit of irony as well in this name, given the circumstances in which it's given. This whole prophecy to Ahaz is that God is not going to be with Judah in the days to come. He's going to allow them to be attacked. God will still be with them. He will not leave them or forsake them in, in a complete and in total manner. There will be a remnant left. This, however, isn't even the only use of the term Emmanuel in the book of Isaiah. In the, next, in the next chapter, in chapter 8, verses 5 through 10, we read the following. The Lord spoke to me again. Because this people has refused the waters of Shiloh that flow gently and rejoice over Rezin and the son of Remaliah, and th therefore, behold, the Lord is bringing up against them the waters of the river, mighty and many, the king of Assyria, and all his glory. And it will rise over its channels and go over all its banks. And it will sweep on into Judah. It will overflow and pass on, reaching even to the neck. And its outspread wings will fill the breadth of your land. O Emmanuel. O Emmanuel. This is a picture of oncoming destruction for Judah. And it happens. They do get attacked by the Assyrians. And the history of Judah will never be the same. Be broken, you peoples. Picking back up verse 9. And be shattered. Give ear, all of you far off countries. Strap on your armor and be shattered. Strap on your armor and be shattered. Take counsel together, but it will come to nothing. Speak a word, but it will not stand, for God is with us. God is with us. There's Emmanuel again. Emmanuel's land is going to be attacked. They will become vassals to the Assyrians. And then come the Babylonians. What has Ahaz done? It's the Babylonians who will take Judah into captivity. What has he done? He has put the kingship, the line of David, on the line. And Emmanuel will not inherit a good land. He will not inherit a strong land. Kingdom. As a matter of fact, when we go back to Isaiah chapter 7 and pick up at verse 15, we read that he shall eat curds and honey when he knows how to refuse the evil and choose the good. Now, if your mind goes back uh, to uh, Genesis or to Exodus, you might remember that eating the land being filled with milk and honey was a good thing. It was a sign of prosperity. But this is not milk and honey. This is curds and honey. Curds and honey are the food of poverty. A sign that the land is not rich. A sign that there is no, there are no crops. That things have been sacked. As a matter of fact, if we go down in Isaiah chapter 7, verses 21 through 24, we read this. In that day, a man will keep alive a young cow and two sheep. And because of the abundance of milk that they give, he will eat curds. For everyone who is left in the land left in the land, will eat curds and honey. In that day, every place where there, where there used to be a thousand vines worth a thousand shekels of silver will become briars and thorns. With bows and arrows, a man will come there 
for all the land will be briars and thorns. It's a picture of desolation. Emmanuel's land becomes worth nothing. Now this will take place over time. We know that after the Assyrian invasion, the kingdom is never the same. Then there's the Babylonian captivity. Then there's the Medes and the Persians. And then the Greeks. And the Romans. They'll never be the same. They will never be the kingdom of old. Picking up at verse 16. For the, before the boy knows how to refuse the evil and choose good, the land whose two kings you will dread. Whose two kings you will dread. The Lord will bring upon you and upon your people and upon your father's house such days as have not come since the day that Ephraim departed from Judah, the king of Assyria. So these, these two other kings... That, Isaiah, that Ahaz is worried about are mentioned here. Isaiah 7, 4 refers to them as two smoldering stumps of firebrands. He says, they're going to be nothing. You're worried about them and they're going to be taken over by the Assyrians. Now there is some question as to whether the section about the boy pertains to Isaiah's son. Isaiah's son was actually with him. In Isaiah 7, 3, we read, The Lord said to Isaiah, Go out to meet Ahaz, and you and your, and Shear Jashub, your son, at the end of the conduit of the upper pool on the highway to the washer's field. It could be that. However, the context seems to indicate that the child of the virgin will be born after the Assyrian invasion, perhaps long after. That kind of fits the context, too. Before the boy knows how to refuse evil and choose good, it's long before, before that. You're going to get sacked. He'll not be born to reign on the earthly throne of David, for the earthly throne of David will be no more. Yet, God has not finished. If we, if we continue on in this lengthy section, there's prophecy after prophecy regarding Emmanuel. Chapter 9, for unto us a child is born. Chapter 11, the righteous branch. And the Emmanuel theme continues to build. Now, although Isaiah puts the future of the house of David at risk, God's purposes shall be fulfilled. In Isaiah chapter 8, beginning at verse 11, we read, For the Lord spoke thus to me with his strong hand upon me and warned me not to walk in the way of this people, saying, do not call conspiracy all that this people calls conspiracy. And do not fear what they fear, nor be in dread. But the Lord of hosts, him you shall honor as holy. Let him be your fear, and let him be your dread. The problem is that Ahaz and likely the rest of Judah were in fear of their enemies instead of having proper reverencing fear for the Lord. Continuing on back in, in chapter 8, picking up at verse 14. You will become a sanctuary and a stone of offense and a rock of stumbling to both houses of Israel, a trap and a snare to the inhabitants of Jerusalem. And many shall stumble on it. They shall fall and be broken. They shall be snared and taken. Bind up the testimony, seal the teaching among my disciples. I will wait for the Lord who is hiding his face from the house of Jacob, and I will hope in him. Behold, I and the children whom the Lord has given me are signs and portents in Israel from the Lord of hosts who dwells in Mount Zion. 
how here is Emmanuel described? He is described as a sanctuary. He is described as a refuge. He is described as a place for those who fear the Lord. And as a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense causing people to trip. Who is that stone of stumbling and a rock of offense? Romans 9, 30-33 What shall we say then? The Gentiles who do not pursue righteousness have attained it, that is a righteousness that is by faith, but that Israel who pursued the law that would lead to righteousness to succeed in reaching that law? Why? Because they did not pursue it by faith, but as if it were based on works. They have stumbled over the stumbling stone. As it is written, Behold, I am laying in Zion a stone of stumbling, and a rock of offense, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. We read a similar passage just a little bit ago in 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 4 through 8. As you come to him, a living stone rejected by men, but in the sight of God chosen and precious, you yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifice ex acceptable through Jesus Christ. For it stands in Scripture, Behold, I am laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone, chosen and precious, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. So the honor is for you who believe, but who do not believe. The stone that the builders have rejected has become the cornerstone, and the stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. They stumble because they disobey the word as they were destined to do. Jesus Christ is the dividing line of history. He is the dividing line of humanity. Some will find in him safety, comfort, refuge, peace, forgiveness of sins, life everlasting. Others will trip over him and stumble and fall. We even see that about the way that Christmas is celebrated. I found it odd when I was in uh, Jakarta that there were Christmas trees. But right with the Christmas trees, and even though there were Christmas songs playing, there was Santa Claus. <laughs> And a lot of the other trappings that have become Christmas to most people. And it's okay to talk about Christmas, or to talk about Santa. Christmas magic is another one that's a lot in the Christmas specials. That's what Christmas magic. We can talk about trees, we can talk about decorations, we can talk about gifts. But don't dare talk about Jesus. What? A shame. You know, the irony of talking about Santa and not talking about Jesus is that Santa Claus is based on a real person, St. Nicholas. St. Nicholas, if you've never seen this, is famous for giving gifts, but also for being at the Council of Nicaea where they were discussing whether Jesus is in fact God. And another man stood up and proclaimed heresy that Jesus is not God. And Nicholas, according to tradition, stood up, walked across the room, and slapped the man in the face. St. Nicholas would not be very happy to see what he has been turned into is a reason to not talk about Emmanuel, God with us. Jesus is the source of our joy, the source of our comfort. He is Emmanuel, God with us, as we see in Matthew 
chapter 1, verses 22 to 23, all this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. He's the source of all peace. He is the one because of whom we should not fear. The sign of Emmanuel is given to Ahaz because Ahaz did not show fear for the Lord. But for us, the sign of Emmanuel shows us that we have nothing to fear. Just as the angels said, fear not. The angels did not bring bad news. The angels did not bring news of an attack. They bring good news. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. Jesus Christ is peace to us. He is comfort. He is joy to us, life to us. But yet to some he is still a rock of stumbling and a stone of offense. This started quickly after Jesus was born with, with Herod seeking to put him to death. Quite simply, in our celebration of Christmas, as we celebrate the birth of Christ, Emmanuel, God with us, it will offend. Our love of Jesus Christ, Emmanuel, will offend. But let us find joy and peace and comfort and no fear as we boldly proclaim this season the merriest of Christmases, including the tidings of salvation to all that we need. Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you for all of your good gifts to us. We thank you for your word, and we thank you for Emmanuel. Uh, now, Lord, as we uh, go about this week, Lord, give us the peace and the joy and take away all fear of proclaiming Jesus Christ as Lord. I pray this in Jesus' name. This is Pastor Howard Sloan of King of Kings Reformed Church here in Bedford, Pennsylvania. Thank you for taking the time to listen to this sermon today, and I hope it blessed you. If you would like more information about King of Kings Reformed Church, you can visit us on the web at kingofkingsreformed.com, or you can check us out on Facebook at King of Kings Bedford. Either way, I hope you check us out, and may you find the blessing of knowing and being known by our Lord Jesus Christ.